Security briefings, uh, what a year, uh, what a difference a year can make in U.S.-India relations. Uh, we're just marked the one-year anniversary of Prime Minister Modi's election, uh, the six-month anniversary of our ambassador going out, um, and uh, Def Defense Secretary uh, Ash Carter's uh, visit, which following on the President's successful visit, uh, helped move the ball forward on some important initiatives. So uh, things have changed pretty dramatically, and having the ambassador here to give us an update and overview on exactly where things are at from his perspective is extremely timely. So I don't think I need to say a lot about Ambassador uh, Richard R. Verma. Uh, judged by this door-busting crowd, he's still one of the most well-connected people in Washington, even if he's living a little further away right now. Uh, military service in the Air Force, uh, he's worked for foundations uh, in the private sector, in the administration as Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs, on the Hill with Senator Harry Reid and, uh, and, and, and Congressman Murtha, um, and last but not least, well, maybe least, also at a think tank, uh, giving his time to the Center for... Uh, for, uh, uh, for American progress and, and many other activities that have been involved in over the years. Um, all that's left to do, I think, in, in that resume is to play for the Washington Nationals. Um, <laughs> and it'll have a, a very much, a, a, you know, the, I think the, uh, the career goal is completed there. Uh, sworn in as ambassador in December of 2014. Uh, and as you know, when you arrive in, a, in an interesting foreign land with a r nice big house, um, visitors always come knocking. And he got a great one the first month that he was out there with uh, President Obama's visit and all the accompanying things that go along with that. So uh, uh, Ambassador Verma, now you're the point person for turning this uh, great framework that was established into substance and I welcome you on stage. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Verma. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here at CSIS. Uh, let me thank Dr. Hamry and Rick, especially you, uh, we've really relied on your scholarship and your insights into U.S.-India over these many years. I see uh, a lot of friends and familiar faces in the, uh, in the audience, so it, it, it is terrific to be here. I didn't uh, think that playing for the Washington Nationals was a possibility. Um, <laughs> if you think that's possible, I actually would come back to, uh, to do that, even though I was a Pirates fan my, my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have had a really uh, interesting and fascinating time uh, since we got there in, in early January. Uh, as you said, the president was there, and you know, by the time I even got there on the ground in early January, there were already several hundred people on the ground working on that <laughs> one visit. And four days after I was there, the Secretary of State was there. Um, and since that time, we've had uh, at least a half dozen cabinet secretaries also visit, which is uh, new and, and you know, not accidental. People are coming because they believe in the, in the promise of this uh, relationship. I've also uh, had the good fortune of, of taking 16 trips so far around India, uh, north, south, east, west. I've gone to, actually also gone to Bhutan, so I guess that's 17 trips. Um, but you really do feel the excitement and the re re renewed enthusiasm in terms of what's possible in U.S. India. I had a, a reporter actually ask me the other day. She said, "Boy, after the president left, um, things must have really quieted down for you. You know, you guys just must be kind of looking for something to do." And I thought, "Boy, I really need to get out more often <laughs> and tell people what we're working on because the pace really, really hasn't um, hasn't let up." So. Again, thank you for the, for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, as I think most of you know, this may mark the one-year anniversary since uh, Prime Minister Modi rose to power in what was, at the time, the largest election in history. And this anniversary has generated uh, a lot of commentary about the progress India has made over the last year and the challenges that still remain. And today, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what we in the embassy have seen and uh, why we are still very optimistic uh, for the opportunities and an even stronger partnership for the years to come. The last time I was in Washington a few months ago, I shared my concept of a strategic plus relationship between the U.S. and India, which reflects really our sense of an enhanced commitment to our shared interest. And the strategic plus relationship has blossomed in the last year, highlighted by these two Obama-Modi summits, the cup of tea and everything that went with it. And the roots of this relationship go very deep, however. They grow from the diaspora community, which stretches back to the farmers from the Punjab who came to work 
the California soil in the 1800s to help build railroads and work in lumber mills. They were strengthened by the thousands of scientists and doctors who traveled to the US in the 1950s and 60s, bringing our research and academic communities more closely together. And these roots are invigorated by the steady stream of technology and business leaders who continue to enrich both of our countries through bold innovations. Now, like millions of fellow Americans, my family tree is rooted in this diaspora community. And a few weeks ago, I had the good pleasure and fortune of traveling to Jalandhar in the state of Punjab, where my parents are from. And I returned to the home of my grandmother, where I spent a summer as a young boy. I visited the girls' school, where my grandmother taught, uh, talked to people who knew her. I also had the humbling honor of giving the commencement address at the college where my father graduated from 64 years ago. I went to the classroom where, where he was, where I, I know he was a better student than I probably was. <laughs> um, I spoke to the new graduates about our shared history and about the vast opportunities available to them in this India on the rise, a place where transformational leaders can and do and will have a real impact. Now the roots of Strategic Plus did not sprout overnight, but they go back generations. And similarly, our relationship is not defined only by a handful of singular achievements over the past decades. Clearly, there have been headline-catching breakthroughs, but our relationship is built on more than just bold proclamations and high-level visits, and it transcends any one individual or party. It is built on continual incremental progress, on gaining trust, on engaging in open discussions on difficult issues. It is built on strong and growing people-to-people -people relationships where students, innovators, and family ties stitch our countries together in a constant exchange of ideas. It is built on the dialogue that takes place every day between our governments in which we are working closely together to achieve the joint vision set forth by the President and the Prime Minister. Most importantly, I believe our relationship is built to last because it is rooted in our deeply shared cultural values, our democratic systems, and our common commitment to regional and global stability. Let me say a word about foreign policy, because in foreign policy, India has been on the move. In the past year, the Prime Minister has reached out not just to the United States, but he has visited over 18 countries and 33 cities. He is signaling that India will be a player on the global stage for years to come. And we welcome and support that global leadership role politically, economically, and in global institutions. Within the region, he's reached out to leaders from Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka. He finalized a historic land boundary agreement, which he will sign during his upcoming visit to Bangladesh. There have been visits to Mauritius, to the Seychelles, demonstrating that India wants to play an active role in the Indian Ocean. We have also been heartened and frankly grateful for the leadership role that India has shown in the face of recent crises. India's response to the devastating earthquake in Nepal was remarkable. When disaster struck, India spared no time in mobilizing its sophisticated crisis management mechanisms, providing crucial support to a neighbor in need. In a similar gesture, India rushed to provide fresh water assistance to the Maldives when its water treatment facility ceased operating. India displayed leadership beyond regional boundaries. In Yemen, India organized land and sea evacuations of civilians. That included nationals from all over the world, including the United States and Pakistan. Both in Yemen and Nepal, we were thrilled to see the Indian Air Force using its US-made C-17s and C-130s in support of its humanitarian assistance. As part of its Act East agenda, India has strengthened ties with Asian powers. The Prime Minister has been working closely with Prime Minister Abe, in recognition of India's shared interests with Japan, he's visited Australia and made a historic trip to Fiji. India signed its first permanent member, permanent ambassador to ASEAN this year. And during his recent visit to China, Prime Minister Modi was able to strike a balanced tone uh, between enhancing cooperation and seeking to resolve outstanding issues. And of course, the US and India are partnering more closely than ever before. We are tracking 77 different initiatives that came out of the January 
Obama Modi summit in fields that range from defense cooperation to health and renewable energy. And our collaboration is broad based and global in nature. Our doctors and health experts are working together in Africa on disease prevention and to fight HIV and AIDS. The joint strategic vision on the Indo-Pacific we announced during the president's visit outlined our ways, outlined ways our nations can come together in the region to further the prospects for peace and stability. And our two democracies are demonstrating how the region can work collabor collaboratively towards a better future based on a respect for a rules-based order and the peaceful resolution of disputes. And I think the Prime Minister had it exactly right in the recent issue of Time Magazine when he said, it's not just what the US and India can do for each other, it is what each of us can do for the world when we operate together. Prime Minister has also reached out to the Indian community overseas in cities like New York, Toronto, and Sydney. He's spoken to packed arenas, encouraging the diaspora to become active in India's development and promoting India's influence in the world. He has met with business leaders looking for new partners in his quest to modernize India's economy. And these leaders will be crucial to India's domestic agenda as there are high expectations for a renewed focus on economic growth. Now, there are also opportunities uh, for, US Indi for US industry in several of the initiatives set forth by the government. And I'll just mention uh, a few really tied to the Secretary of Defense's recent visit there this week. For example, India has prioritized developing its domestic manufacturing sector through the Make in India program. And many of the ideas we're discussing under the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative or DTTI, or what it initially was called was the Carter Initiative, as it was constructed by the now Secretary of Defense, are an excellent fit with Make in India. Through DTTI, the US and Indian defense communities are collaborating on development and production of new technologies. DTTI signifies our commitment to modernizing India's military forces while promoting economic growth both in the US and India. And again, DTTI is a special focus of the Defense Secretary who had a very successful trip there, as I mentioned. This was his fourth trip to India while in government, and he became the first American Secretary of Defense to visit an Indian Operational Military Command, Eastern Naval Command in Vizag. Secretary Carter, along with Defense Minister Parikar, signed a new 10-year defense framework agreement and finalized the first two project agreements under DTTI to develop mobile battlefield power systems and next generation chem bioprotection suits. As Secretary Carter stated, quote, these projects are intended to blaze a trail for things to come, end quote. This is really the beginning of what's possible. I'm particularly excited about the aircraft carrier working group which was designed to support India's own efforts to build its naval aviation and blue water capabilities. And I recently had the good fortune of joining a contingent of Indian naval officers to fly out to the USS Carl Vincent. And standing on the flight deck, listening to the officers from the US and Indian navies, I was struck by the high level of interest on both sides and in the possibility of collaboration. And I will tell you, for me, it was a glimpse into what's possible in the future, to see our senior naval officers and naval aviators standing side by side was a terrific thing. And reflecting this interest, the DTTI Aircraft Carrier Working Group is off to a fast start, and later this month, the U.S. contingent will host a team from India to visit a U.S. aircraft carrier and conduct the group's inaugural meeting. Ultimately, the aim is to identify specific areas for technology cooperation. Of course, the success of the Make in India initiative will hinge in large part on India's economic and investment climate. In 2014, the World Bank ranked India 142 out of 189 countries in its Ease of Doing Business Index. Recognizing that it needs to do better, the Prime Minister has announced that he would like to see India ranked in the top 50. Now, we have seen some concrete steps towards that goal. In April, the Indian cabinet approved legislation to establish commercial courts, which would dramatically reduce delays in resolving business disputes. The government has also taken steps to streamline its services through various e-governance initiatives. 
As many of you know, we are also working hard to assess the prospects for moving forward with a high standard bilateral investment treaty, something I know that uh, Rick and CSIS have talked a lot about. But a high standard bit would further enhance investor confidence and send an important signal to U.S. investors, especially infrastructure investors, that India is open for business. Ultimately, though, the direction of the economy is one for India to decide. But I sense there is recognition among many that if India is going to realize its goals for make in India, it needs to adopt an attitude of encouraging foreign investment, not just permitting it. This will take not just welcoming words, but decisive actions in a range of areas, including on tax, on intellectual property, and regulatory streamlining. There is another reason for optimism, and that is the cooperative federalism and encouragement of states that are now competing for investment. And I think we're seeing an increasing race to the top among Indian states to attract outside investment, including FDI, which will be good for India and it will be good for our relationship as well. Just last month, senior representatives from both Andhra Pradesh and Telangana were in the U.S. on roadshows to promote their respective states as investment destinations. Google recently announced that it will build its largest campus outside the U.S. in Telangana, a strong sign of that state's efforts to promote itself as an investment destination. We encourage more such efforts, but we are also actively encouraging Indian investment and job creation in the United States. India recently brought 82 companies to the Commerce Department's Select USA Summit, the second highest contributor of any country in the world. And this leads to another area we are all tracking closely, which is bilateral trade. We are pleased that our trade in goods and services has finally crossed the elusive $100 billion threshold and stands at approximately $103 billion. Now, we have a long way to go to reach the $500 billion target set by President Obama, but we think it is achievable given the size of our economies and the size of our countries. We recently restarted our trade policy forum, which is bringing together Indian and American trade experts to address concerns across a variety of sectors. And on intellectual property, a technical team of Indian experts will visit Washington for further discussions on how to improve IP protections. We continue to look for ways to enhance the environment for innovation in a way that promotes and protects our shared interests. And through the State Department's Indo-Pacific Economic Corridor Initiative, we are also supporting greater regional economic connectivity between India and its neighbors, complementing the Prime Minister's Act East policy. Many of you may not know, but South Asia is the least interconnected of all the regions in the world, accounting for a very small fraction of country-to-country -country trade. And so through programs aimed at enhancing energy cooperation, building closer people-to-people -people ties, stimulating trade facilitation, transportation, and easing customs and borders, our IPEC initiative seeks to strengthen link links among South Asian countries. Now, economic growth is important, but sustainable development is also imperative. And both countries recognize that meeting energy needs in a sustainable manner is one of the most important challenges of the 21st century. The development of cleaner and more efficient energy technologies will contribute significantly to improving air quality, addressing climate change, and protecting the global environment. And as leaders of the new high-tech economy, our countries can achieve robust economic growth while protecting the environment. Now, India has set ambitious goals for clean energy development and aims to sharply increase its renewable capacity to 175 gigawatts through wind and solar by 2022. And under our energy, uh, clean energy cooperation programs, we've already mobilized over $2 billion in clean energy projects, and we have further plans to expand our efforts. And American firms have a big role to play from supplying the technology to consulting to financing specific projects. Now, as we look ahead in the coming months, climate change will be a central focus for us in the lead up to the talks in Paris in December. India's participation is crucial for any global climate agreement to meaningfully address the challenges the global community faces. And we look forward to an ambitious 
and transparent plan on reducing emissions. Now, India has signaled its commitment towards combating climate change by recently agreeing to discuss the phase down of HFCs, reducing the production and consumption of these super greenhouse gases through the Montreal Protocol is a significant and pragmatic step in the right direction. Now, some of you may have read about another concern, which is air quality, which is an issue that faces a lot of us in New Delhi and, frankly, around India. The Global Burden of Disease Study, considered the gold standard in global epidemiology, shows air pollution as the fifth greatest factor for premature death in India, claiming 630,000 lives a year. So tackling air pollution is good not only for our lungs, but for people's health, and it's part of a wider strategy to address climate concerns. And in the past few months, I've seen both the Indian press and government officials pay more attention to the effects of air pollution on health and safety. And in March, I was pleased that Indian officials welcomed a delegation from the EPA to discuss urban air quality. This is a partnership area where we can use what we've learned over the past several decades of combating our own air pollution right here in the United States so we can use what we've learned to address this global challenge. Just let me touch on one final subject, which is the, the challenge of urbanization in India, because the scale of urbanization is like nothing that we've seen anywhere else. So Prime Minister Modi has recognized that urban India is due for an overhaul, and this presents special challenges for development, but also many opportunities for collaboration. And we are committed to working with India to transform its cities into healthy and safe spaces that provide high quality services and economic opportunity. The 100 Smart Cities Initiative has captured the popular imagination in both India and the United States. And we are using a whole of mission approach to develop smart city projects in three cities, Vizag, Ajmer, and Alalaba. Smart cities are not destinations but are part of a process. They are about continuous collaboration among public and private stakeholders to improve the quality of life for urban dwellers. And we are connecting US firms with opportunities that match the priorities set forth by the central and local governments. Finance is a big challenge, of course, for this initiative, so we're using our convening power to enlist the support of finance agencies such as XM and OPIC, along with the Asian Development Bank. We're also focused on using technology and global best practices to deliver smart city solutions that are cost effective, scalable, and replicable. This includes providing GIS data to help Allahabad connect more of its sewer lines to water treatment plants, helping the desert city of Ajmer recharge critical water reservoirs, mapping fresh groundwater resources to help farmers in Vizag recover from severe storms. Smarter cities are are also cleaner and healthier cities. Now, lack of access to clean water and sanitation services has serious consequences for many urban communities. And to tackle this issue, USAID is working with the Ministry of Urban Development and other private partners to support the Prime Minister's Clean India campaign. And we're trying to bring the leadership, the talent, and the resources of the public and private sector to generate solutions to India's water, sanitation, and hygiene challenges. We're working in Bangalore, for example, with the city administration to provide 32,000 households with clean drinking water. Uh, we're doing similar things with India in, it, in our call to action plan to NTB. And American scientists from the CDC and other agencies are working with government officials, NGOs, and researchers on improving labs and training in the public health workforce so we are better prepared for outbreaks like Ebola and other pandemics. Now, as with economic reform in general, progress on all of these initiatives will be incremental. But we are seeing the Indian bureaucracy do more than just lay foundation stones. They are being proactive in their engagement and discussions, not just with us, but other partners as well. And if we keep these up, we will see many of these ideas become realities. So in closing, let me just say we, we do have our work cut out for us. There are many additional initiatives we could discuss, and I'm happy to tackle those in the Q&A. 
But generally speaking, I am optimistic and I am enthusiastic about where the relationship is heading. And this is an exciting time to be in New Delhi. And during, as I said, the first six months, we've seen a real commitment by our partners in India to carry out a bold vision for an India on the rise. And as I said, there will be challenges, but there is a renewed sense of possibility. And I continue to believe we are on a path to increase cooperation across all sectors and becoming India's best partner, as President Obama called for in January. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> um, well, Ambassador Verma, you know, going back, I think, to, um, to before you went out, and we had a couple of conversations, and we talked a lot about Indian states, and you've, you've been out there, you've done it. You know, sitting here in Washington, it makes a lot of sense. You look at the numbers, you look at the importance, it makes a lot of sense. But you show up as, as the ambassador to the United States with the state government. How does that conversation go? What do they look for from the United States in terms of partnerships? What is it that they think they can offer? Um, can you give us a sense? You know, sure. I know that you've been to a number of corners. Yeah, I, I, and it's been, uh, it's been really exciting, uh, frankly, to go in and meet with chief ministers who want to talk about how hospitable their state is to foreign investment and to uh, American corporate uh, interests so that they can come in and help jumpstart the economy in that region. I'll just give you a couple examples. You go into some states and they now talk about a single window uh, for regulatory approvals uh, where you go in and you don't go to um, 80 different places. You know, I think it's, it's commonly uh, recited that to build a hotel in India requires about 80 permits. Um, they're now talking about going to one window for regulatory approvals. Now, not sure what happens behind that window, but um, <laughs> that, is, that, is a good, that is a good development. They talk similarly about, uh, about the, the ability to get land, if, if needed, in a, in a fair and transparent way. They talk about the court system and the, and the tax system. So there's, like I said, it, we, we call it a race to the top because there really is a, a very healthy competition taking place among the states not just for U.S. companies, but for investment across India and investment from, from Europe and beyond and, and Asia as well. So I, I think it's a, it's a very, very good and encouraging sign. You know, some, of the, some of the big initiatives that we have from Washington to Delhi, you know, let's just say like defense technology and trade initiative, which could result in more production, things like that. Do they make the connection between the high level issues that you deal with in Delhi with how that could actually, you know, FDI caps, things like that. Do they make the connection, or is it, or is it very commercial deal oriented when you get to the state level? No, I think they make the connection. I think, look, this this notion of ease of doing business is not, uh, you know, it is it is many different things. It's a patchwork of many different things. It's not a, a switch that you just flip <laughs> and all of a sudden business becomes. Yeah. Uh, better overnight. It is, it is giving people confidence, like I said, in the legal system. So this development of co commercial courts is very important because it's about developing confidence in the intellectual property enforcement regimes. Uh, it is about tax certainty. It is about land. It is about um, transparency and decision making, speed of decision making. So it's all these things some of those are, are directed by the center, some of those are by the states, but it is a general perception that investors will be treated fairly and that India is open for, for business. And that if there are disputes, that there are mechanisms to handle those disputes fairly and, and swiftly. So it is, it is a mix of center and, and, uh, and states. Look, it, they're a federal system, we're a federal system. We, we see the same you know, sometimes there are, there are tensions in, in these relationships, but I, I think people do appreciate that it's, it is a range of things that have to be done mm -hmm. in order to improve that, that ranking, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, looking at, uh, at the, really the, 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 the back and forth nature of the business relationship, or, or even broader than just business relationship, when you go in and meet with, um, with government officials, with private sector 
You know, what in the, in the six months that you've been out there are the recurring themes, problems that they have with policies here? What are the things they bring up regularly? Is it focused on visas? Is there a new generation of issues? Or is it the typical ones we've been hearing for many years? You're talking about American? No, Indian, Indian companies, Indian government. What are, what are the things, the changes they want to see here that they oh, think will facilitate a, a deeper uh, relationship? Interesting. Yeah, no, I, and I'm glad you mentioned that point because, you know, so often we talk as, about the changes that need to occur in, in Delhi and we forget about the changes that need to occur in Washington. And uh, the fact is there, there have been changes in Washington from export control reform uh, to talks that the Indian government would like to see, for example, on, on social security totalization, talks that uh, are, will be upcoming, um, talks on technology transfer, not just in the defense space, but in the, in, in the clean energy space as well. And uh, so, no, there are, there, trust me, it is a, a two-way conversation. I would say visas is, is much less a part of the conversation. I think people should know that uh, the embassy issued over a million visas uh, last year. We're on a 30% increase this year. That number sh shows no sign of dropping. Um, India continues to get 65%, the dominant share of H-1B visas, 35% of the L-1 or intercompany uh, visas. So, you know, frankly, I'm hearing less about individual kind of visa cases. And I, I actually, what I'm really excited about is the interest in Indian companies and Indian investors creating opportunities in the United States as well. That, that is exciting. The two-way trade numbers are up mm -hmm. and the investment numbers, and, and, and it's, it's really great to talk about job creation in both places. Yeah. I'm uh, sure you know that's, that's, that's the main bailiwick that I try to stand on here too, which is it still feels from Washington like on the economic front, things aren't going that well, but the numbers show a real big pop since the, since the elections. FDI is way up, FII is way up, trade is coming up nicely. So it does feel there's a bit of a disconnect between the sense here in Washington versus the numbers that you see. I think peop all, you know, people, whether they're in the United States or in India, they want change faster. Yeah. And that's understandable. Voters, I think, in both of our countries, you know, sometimes have a short uh, span that they want to give to political officials, and we understand that in, in both countries. But I think you're right. If you look at the investment numbers, if you look at inflation remains low, if you look at the economic growth numbers, they remain high. Now, I think uh, experts would say that India could do much better, and there could be much bigger numbers posted. But look, we're you know, everyone has to operate within the, the system that they have politically and economically. But I, I think you're right. I think the story is still very positive, and that's, that's something I wanted to convey here. Uh, one last question before, before I open it up. So you talked a lot about the work that you're doing to further America's national objectives in engaging India on security and economic front. You know, but for you personally, six months in now, are there a couple of specific things for that five minutes a week when you actually get to direct yourself a little bit more instead of just reacting to the big things that are happening around you? Are there a couple of you know, issue areas that you personally want to kind of put your stamp on? What, what's your sense on that? Sure, so one, I'd like to, you know, part of the reason I've done uh, 16 trips is not just because I like to go to the airport. It is, um, <laughs> though I think the, the Delhi airport was voted the number one airport in the world still, um, it is to go reach a segment of people that may not have heard from a U.S. ambassador before, may not know why this relationship matters. So to, to you know, it's like living here for 20 years, and when you, you need to get out to understand what the rest of the country actually um, thinks and feels and wants. And so I've been really trying to get out of Delhi and talk to, you know, let's say non-traditional groups, groups that. Uh, wouldn't ordinarily be involved in a you know foreign policy mm -hmm. or trade or geopolitical discussion. So, you know young, that means young people. That means people who um, maybe uh, are in in villages. People who may not be in urban centers. And I, I I'd like to do more of that. And it is amazing what kind of impact uh, you can have by just showing. That, uh, that we really do care. We do really care about India's growth. We care about people's prosperity. We, keep, we care about bringing people from the, from the bottom of the pyramid into the, into the middle of the pyramid. And so the, the more of that we can do, and that doesn't take a lot of money, frankly. Those are not big ticket items. 
I have, I have sat with um, migrant communities that make uh, cricket bats, for example, on the side of a highway. Okay. And the reason I was there was because USAID funds a solar-powered battery pack that allows them to have power in order to shave the, the wood and in order to power the, the lights. It also keeps their family safe. So they had a lot of kids running around. You know, that is, that is a small ticket item having a huge impact on, on a community. So the more of that we can do and talk about, I think the, the better it'll be. That's great. Well, we've got about uh, 20 minutes uh, to take uh, questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, let's start up. We've got a couple of microphones coming around. Yep. yep. It's right there. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Krishna. I'm with the U.S. India Security Council. I want two questions. One is, what are the other areas that we are working closely on defense between the United States and India? We are interested. Number two is, when defense secretary is in India, what are you doing here now? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> so, def you know, defense and security cooperation continue to be the, um, it's a cornerstone of our, of our relationship. And defense is much more than defense sales. And I think we too often think, you know, this is about transactional uh, items. I'm very pleased with the defense sale numbers and the trajectory they've taken. But we also need to think about common operating vision and how we would work together, whether it's on humanitarian response, whether it's on combating weapons of mass destruction. And I know there's a, there's a lot of people in this room uh, who have worked on that set of issues, and we will continue to work on that. So, Thinking towards the future, like I said, that, that notion of, of, the, of what's possible coming out of the aircraft carrier working group, that's very exciting. So it's, it's obviously defense sales. It is military to military training. It is the common operating uh, environment. It's getting to know each other in, in terms of how we would deal with crises. And it's building out this joint vision for the Asia Pacific. Uh, it's intelligence cooperation, it's homeland defense, it is the whole spectrum of security cooperation. We face similar threats, and so we, um, we, we are natural partners, the President has said it, and so the defense space is a, is a natural. Good. And, uh, you know, that was a great... Uh, I want the first time I'm Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah get me in trouble. So, um, so... It's interesting. I talked to Secretary Carter about this and explained the fourth grade graduation, this, the, the 10 year old uh, birthday, and a, and a few other consultations that I had to do back here. But, but I'm so glad he had. Thank you. He is a real person, so yeah. we have to deal with that. Um, but I appreciate also, uh, you know, of course, uh, letting us know who you are, who you represent, and keeping the shorts, uh, sh keeping the, uh, the questions uh, quiet. Um, Sumani up at the front here. It's coming right behind you. Yep. Thank you. I'm Sumani with the Confederation of Indian Industry here in Washington. Always a pleasure to see you, and thank you for the opportunity to letting us uh, host you while you were in Punjab. I was just curious if there's any specific initiatives or programs that you're looking at enhancing SME integration between the two countries. The big players, of course, I think will continue to engage, and we're seeing a lot of that FDI coming in. But if you want to see that bump in trade figures, it's really the SMEs that we want to see more, uh, both on, in the U.S. and in India, starting to engage more. So any thoughts on how to make that happen? Well, it's, a, it's a really, it's a good question. And I think it's, um, you know, the notion of, of integration is, uh, is really important. You know, what's, what's interesting is that as you talk to American companies, big companies now that are operating in India, um, they don't really see boundaries anymore. You know, they, they you know, I, I think of the, the multimodal facility I went to for GE in, in Pune, and they said, look, um, we're going to do four different product lines here, but design is going to take place in Pittsburgh, marketing is going to take place somewhere else. You know, the, the notion of these global integrated product lines of which India is a key player and of which the United States is a key player is really important. And it's just, it was a good kind of vision for the future about kind of how to integrate our business conversations, our supply chains, our companies, more of it's happening. I mean, I'd, I'd welcome, frankly, the input of CII in terms of how to do, do more of it, but it is, it is actually occurring now. 
But and that's to the question on, on SMEs, that's a, that's a kind of thing that SMEs can plug into? That's what Shimani was referencing. Yeah, we're, we, should, we should talk about that because that, be, that would be an important uh, discussion to have. Yeah. Good, yeah, right over here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen, I'm from the University of Southern California. Um, yesterday we attended an event at the Atlantic Center with Ambassador Chowdhury of Pakistan. And I was, and he was very adamant about the relationship between India and Pakistan. And I was wondering what your view, understanding of that relationship was, from the U.S. standpoint. It's interesting. It, it took three questions to get to a Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> In India, it only, it's normally the first uh, yeah. or second. Um, look, uh, you know, we would like to see. Uh, a South Asia that is peaceful and stable and prosperous. Our, our policy in Pakistan is designed to support uh, democratic reformers to, to ensure that is a, a peaceful and prosperous place. When the president was, was there in January, he also talked about the importance of cracking down on safe havens and ensuring that there was zero tolerance and zero space given to terrorist groups operating wherever they might operate. And that is, that is a, a shared commitment that brings India and, and the U.S. closer together. Um, as we've said, and it, as, as it's been U.S. policy for many years, it is ultimately between the two parties to decide um, on the pace, the scope, the character of the talks that, that bring them together. We were encouraged, obviously, when the Pakistani Prime Minister went to the inauguration of the Indian uh, Prime Minister. We were encouraged when the Foreign Secretary went to Islamabad. Uh, and obviously, we support the robust dialogue and, and have been in, encouraging such a dialogue, and we will continue to do so. Great. Yeah, right up at the front, yeah. We have a microphone coming, yep. Uh, Sandhya Mehta, I'm a partner with the law firm Philip Slidel. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned the similarities between the two countries and the common interests. Uh, one view of this is that the similarities have existed for decades. Um, what has changed now uh, that isn't likely to change again in the short term with elections given that both countries <laughs> are you know, democracies problematically. Um, uh, and also, just to um, make, uh, create a slightly more provocative version of the same question, in India, sometimes the perception has been that maybe the United States is not a reliable partner, consistent, reliable partner. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's had to look elsewhere from time to time. What would be your response yeah. to that? You know, look, history can either restrain us or we can um, not be limited by what's possible in the future. You know, there are histories with all kinds of, of, of our partners around the world, and sometimes those histories didn't fulfill the kind of promise we wanted. And obviously, the people-to-people -people ties between our countries have been strong for decades. I mean, not my family is a product of that. Our business-to-business -business ties have been strong for decades. We've had, you know, the, frankly, the people and the businesses have outpaced the governments. Now, the governments are, are, are catching up. And I do think we should appreciate history, but we should not be restrained by it. And we are in a new moment. We have a new opportunity because we also, as you look around the world and you look for those countries that are democracies, that uphold the rule of law, the peaceful resolution of disputes, that have commitments to diversity, to tolerance, that share in so many values, and you know, from the human level to the strategic level, the US and India are really destined to be best partners. And I, and I really believe we're on that course. Now, there are all sorts of reasons over the last few decades why we didn't actually achieve that. I also don't think that will just happen on its own. So you need leaders on both sides that are committed to it. Uh, and I, I've been asked this question many times about, you know, we're now in presidential season here in the United States. I really believe that um, 
you know, the, this commitment to India transcends party. It, it is bipartisan. I would dare say it's nonpartisan in the, in the support that we see for India because of the jointness in, in vision that we have for this stable, democratic, prosperous uh, world. And, and I, again, it is, it is too limiting to think of it in transactional terms. It's also too limiting to think about it in terms of the setbacks that we might have on any given day. Because any two complex, big, mature countries are gonna have disagreements. That's why all these dialogues and all these working groups and all these interactions are so important so we can have mechanisms and outlets when there are disagreements and disputes and so that we can see ahead to this uh, bigger set of objectives we have. And, and I, I think we're there. That's why I think it's not going to be, um, I don't think we're going to see this rolled back. It is kind of funny you mentioned uh, the end of the administration, because I, I do hear when I travel to India too, they're, they're concerned about you know, a lame duck president going into the final. But that's really most relevant when you've got a huge legislative agenda that we need to get through or something like that. But most every area of cooperation is things that we can just do. So uh, lame duck president made history by coming to, to, uh, to India twice no. and to, to participating in Republic Day. Mm. So a lot can happen in the last two years of, uh, of an administration. Yeah, uh, up at the front, Abu. If you can keep it uh, brief and uh, let us know again name and affiliation, so everybody knows. Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Abu Saleh Sharif. Uh, uh, I uh, run the US India Policy Institute here. Um, to me, it appears India is after cheap money for investments, but often investments come, uh, cheap money investments come with inappropriate technology. This has reference to money coming from Japan for uh, bullet trains and that kind of technology. Um, uh, we are a bit worried about how the new technology is going to affect uh, employment in India. Uh, I would like to have some comments on that. The second is uh, so we already have that a technology might actually force a reduction in employment, employment. the adoption of machine-based, you know, yeah, okay. and, in, and within a very short term. Uh, we already have U.S.-India agreement on science and technology during the Manmohan Singh days. Uh, how are you um, using that platform to bring technology uh, partnership between India and India and U.S. So will foreign investment bring technology that could actually reduce jobs? And what are we doing on science and tech cooperation? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yep, thank you. And, Good. and there is a great role for academics there. And I don't see that action still up. Just two, two questions. Ways, That's all. No, there is Abu, a, Abu, that two, there is two a health agenda Abu. and there is a food security agenda. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Okay. Look, all, this is why we're um, calling it strategic plus. The, the plus really is meant to capture a sense, not only an increased scope of geographical coverage, since we're operating well outside of South Asia, but the plus is meant to capture all those areas that you just discussed. I think science, and particularly space cooperation, is a big area of future collaboration. Global health security is not just a future area of cooperation, it is a current area of cooperation. We are operating, and will be operating, in 10 countries outside of India, US and Indian development experts, health experts, scientists in Africa and Asia. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually, and education I think is an, uh, frankly an unfulfilled area. We could do so much more and there's plenty of exchanges, lots of um, tremendous intellectual capability in, in both countries obviously, but we haven't quite yet harnessed the potential in, in higher education collaboration. I hear that from a lot of university presidents in both places that want to do more. So we, we're going we're gonna to work on that. And we got to do more, not just in higher education, but in skills development and skills training, which I think leads to your first question on the impact of technology on, on job creation. We have, I think that concern is not unique to India. We have that, we had that concern. We continue to have that concern here. I grew up in a place you know, that relied on coal and steel from the 1800s into the 1970s. That economy, if you look at Pittsburgh today, that economy has transformed into a health uh, technology, high-tech center, and has, has really persevered. Um, it, this is a question for India to decide how it wants, what kind of workforce it wants to have, how much of domestic manufacturing it wants to have, how it uses technology. I don't view the importation of technology is incompatible 
with economic growth or with job creation, but these are, this is what economists and government officials spend their days ensuring they have the right balance and right mix for. Okay, we've got about uh, three or four minutes. Um, let's get some from further from the back, all the way in the corner there. Hello, my name is Harjap Singh uh, from Brenton Woods Committee. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Ambassador Verma. My question is on people-people exchange. Uh, one of my concerns as an American is that the people-people exchange that's going on in India is mainly with the Indian diaspora community. What can we do to broaden it so that more Americans can be part of that people-people exchange uh, and so that we can have more constructive dialogue on SMEs, university exchanges, entertainment, you name it, so that the initiative is actually a permanent renewed initiative that we can work for decades and not stop flat after Obama's administration leaves? It's a, it's a great question. I actually think the exchanges go beyond the diaspora community. I think that's what you were mentioning. We, when we see the number of students, uh, American students, now studying in India, the number of scholars studying in India, it's well outside the diaspora community. Um, when you look at the kind of cultural and art exchanges, when you look at the literature um, kind of collaboration, uh, obviously there's a set of connections and foundation in the diaspora community, but I think it now goes broader. Uh, I do agree with you that uh, we should try to look for ways to spread it into other communities. And I, I know that our State Department is working very hard on that, and I know our, our mission in India and the four consulates, we work very hard at that. So it, it, I take the point, and, and the more we can do on that score, the better. Um, yeah, back of, near the back on the side. We'll take one or two more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Verma, for reaching out uh, to centers of uh, center as well as the state of uh, Indian states for uh, educating them how we can help and to do the collaboration. But my question is uh, on the, what uh, we can do, I mean the India and US to uh, the drug development and new innovation for inf infectious disease. But India has a lot of potential and the unfinished uh, drugs, which can be easily transformed into a um, good uh, solution for infectious disease. You know, there's a lot happening on that score. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see how many people we have in our government, not only here in Washington, but in New Delhi, in the embassy, that are working on those sets of issues. Center for Disease Control, Control NIH, Health and Human Services. Um, I could go on, but they have really, really robust collaboration. And it's not just um, kind of unfunded or small collaboration. They are now bringing significant resources to the table, um, really which grew out of the Ebola uh, crises. And now, you know, I appreciate what the administration has done so much to make sure this remains, remains a priority. And so I, I think you'll see a lot more exciting things to come in the coming year. Thank There's you. Some good initiatives in the private sector too. Just a few weeks ago, we had an executive from Gilead here um, talking about the work that they've done on leveraging India's low cost production for HIV medicines and now for hepatitis, um, you know, really kind of replicating uh, the work that they've done with, with HIV and the new hepatitis medicine. So you know, the private sector also has, has stepped in on occasions and, and, and shown that you know, they can leverage it as well. Um, okay, we'll go with uh, we'll go with one last one. Um, let's take right over there, please. Yeah, make um, it a good one. This is this is the home run hitter here. All right, so make it a good one. Make it an easy one. How about that? <laughs> uh, Gideon Gross, National Foreign Trade Council. Thank you for coming. Um, from your kind of experience that you've had over the past year. Um, what is the view in India of you know the recent negotiations with you know TPA and TPP, and also would they be interested in kind of joining? Are they kind of more focused on having a more uh, like South Asia multilateral agreement, or would it be kind of a trans-Pacific um, you know area with Southeast Asia and those countries? Yeah. Great one. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. Um, 
I see some of my friends from, from USTR here, so let me just make sure I say this, how important uh, TPP and, and TPA is. And, and I really, really mean that because when you think about the Asia rebalance and you think about, uh, you think about it in non-defense terms, you think about the economic potential of Asia that will be unleashed in this agreement, and that will be good for U.S. jobs and the U.S. economy. Um, it's not just, uh, you know, that, that is just the reality of what that agreement brings to bear. And it, is, it will be high standards, it will have high environmental standards, high worker standards, and that is exactly the kind of agreement that will help transform Asia. And maybe India will be interested in round two, we'll see. But, but that agreement will be core to helping integrate um, economics and trade in Asia and the United States in a really high standard, um, important way. And uh, I'm, I'm confident where things are headed on, on, on TPP. And, and um, again, um, economic integration for Asia is key. For those people who are concerned about security in Asia, who are concerned about human rights in Asia, who are concerned about all the different risks that Asia faces, trade and economics, and doing it in a way that is of a, of a, with high standards is so critically important. India has not been part of these initial discussions. You know, maybe down the road, maybe, um, maybe round two uh, of TPP, we'll see. Yeah, Thanks great. for the question. Well, please, everybody, join me in thanking Ambassador Verma for his leadership <laughs> and his time spent today.